won't say her first year here because she got a little mad when I knew what year it was, but um, she's pretty much been here before any of us athletes have been alive. So that's pretty <laughs> 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 um, currently, she coaches rowing, synchro, cheer, dance, and women's golf. She's a strength and conditioning coach. Um, in all her years here, she's been pretty much been able to coach every single team except for those with weapons, so pistol, rifle, and fencing. Um, her first year here was um, the year that the women's basketball team um, played for the national championship, which is awesome. And she also has three children. So this is Coach D. They tried to give me a microphone. I assured them that that would probably not be necessary. If I can project in French over the fans and ROTC and everything else that's going on, I'm pretty sure that I can succeed in this room. Um, been here a long time, grew up in uh, a little town in Northwest Ohio called Elida. It's right outside of Lima. There were 225 kids in my graduating class and about 90% of them I knew since I was five years old. So kind of a small town environment. Um, Sundays were for church and family, period. You know, back then you weren't rushing after communion out the door to get to a soccer tournament, a baseball practice or anything like that. That's just what you did. So every Sunday, got up, went to church with my family. We all met at my grandmother's for breakfast. Afterwards, spent the day with family. Um, I went to church. I wouldn't say that I was involved in church. We went, we worshiped, we left. That was pretty much the extent of it. Um, like I said, small town environment. Um, my dad was the head football coach at the high school. So if you've ever seen the movie, Remember the Titans, that was me. Um, I, my brother is seven years younger. Nobody ever told my dad I was a girl. So I was in the weight room when I was four years old. <laughs> Never changed. I paraded the weight room a little bit, but pretty much still the same. So I decided I need to go someplace where nobody knows who I am. And I did that. I went out to the University of Arizona. As far as a relationship with God, fortunately he had a relationship with me. I did not have a relationship with him. I had more of a relationship with Budweiser and laying out in the sun, and that was about the extent of it. <laughs> Not great. So I really commend all of you that, you know, you figured it out already and put that first in your life. I was not mature enough to do that. And like I said, I was fortunate enough that God kept watching over me because good decisions were not happening at that time and could have really gone the other direction. But he was there even when I didn't know that he was present. So fortunately, I grew through that, came back to Ohio, decided if I'm moving back to Ohio, it's gonna be Columbus, Cleveland, or Cincinnati. Fortunately, landed here. Started my job at Ohio State, and I'm like, okay, I'm an adult now, I need to find a church. You know, So I church shopped, which people were like, you did what? I picked different churches, and I went and I sat, and I worshiped there, and I wanted to make sure that I found a church that was comfortable. I wasn't really concerned with what the name was on the front of the building, what the religion was. I wanted to be comfortable, so every Sunday I would get up and go and have a relationship with the pastor and with the people that I was worshiping with. And I did that, and I was kind of a novelty. I know you're shocked, because <laughs> most of the congregation was like, you know, a little bit older, and I'm very to the point and very blunt, so once I kind of showed up on the scene, things started to move a little bit faster than they did before I got here. Um, they did a lot of mission work. I started teaching Sunday school, and I really, really loved my church. And it was important to me to get married in a church that was my home, you know, that I had that relationship and I had that connection with. So met my husband, we get married. You know, by this time, I'm 28 years old. I feel like I have things pretty much under control. Hey, we want to start having kids. It's not happening. So after a year, I start to see the doctors. And it keeps going. And it keeps going. And I had to do infertility treatments for a year. The shots, the drugs, all of that. As a control freak, that is very difficult. Because here's this one thing that I want more than anything, and I can't do it. And so every month when you're not pregnant, you failed. I 
failed again, and I failed again, and I failed again. Why can't I have this one thing? So after a year, we were lucky enough and blessed that my daughter, Sydney, was born. I have two more children, same process every time. But at least the feeling of failure wasn't as bad because I did have my daughter. And if that's all that I was ever going to get, then that was going to be okay. So life goes on, continue my career here. Um, my husband and I have been married for 20 years. He's <coughs> been sober for 10 of those. And unfortunately, it hasn't been consecutively. Um, my children grew up very poor when they were little. I am a very proud person. And to not be able to provide for my children hurt me. And it embarrassed me. I definitely didn't want anybody to know. And so that was, you know, they always say, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. And I'm like, I really think you're overestimating me because <laughs> this sucks bad. You know, so we're going through all of these things and and you think that you've got this secret. You know, we go back to control. I'm big on control. And when you live with an alcoholic or an addict, you can't control them, so you work really hard to control everything else. I mean, the money, when I got my paycheck, I would have to cash it right away, and I would have to hide the money so I could pay the bills. Because the money would go when you're talking about somebody who's drinking a case of beer and a fifth of vodka every three days, the money goes fast. So I'm hiding money, you know, I'm trying to get things done. I think that I have this secret control, this dirty little secret. But in the secret, I forget that, you know, I'm somebody who wants to save the earth, so I put the recycle bins out to the corner every week. Well, five recycle bins filled with bottles and cans, somebody's going to pick up on what's going on. So the one Christmas and my one daughter, because my kids didn't realize that they were poor. They didn't realize that they didn't have anything really. And the one Christmas, like two days before Christmas, the doorbell rang and we opened the door and there was nothing there, but there was a bag of toys. And somebody in our neighborhood had noticed and they had given my children toys for Christmas, which is an unbelievable gift. Because it would hurt my heart every time I would go into a store with my oldest daughter, she would be three at the time, and we would see something in the store, and she would pick it up, and the entire time we were in the store, she'd have it with her. And we got ready to leave, she'd put it back, and she'd go, maybe later, mommy, maybe later because she knew she couldn't take it home. So, you know, my kids start to grow. We were married in the church that we're still in. All of my children have been baptized in that church. Um, they are very active in that church with summer camp and the musicals and all of those things, and the church has been very good for them because, like their mother, there's a pride that goes along with that, and they don't share it out in the open, but when they get to Sunday school, they'll share it with their peers. And what they found is there's other people sitting in that room that are in that same situation. And my girls get it, and just to kind of step to the side just a little bit, because kids don't always lock into what's going on. And my husband, the latest stretch of sobriety has been four years, which we're very grateful for. But a couple years ago, we're in the car and my daughters are talking and said something about, you know, my husband being an alcoholic and blah, blah, blah. And then from the back seat, my son goes, who's an alcoholic? And they're like, well, dad is dummy. And he goes, no, he's not. He works all the time and goes to meetings. Well, he goes to AA meetings. <laughs> they're like, what kind of meetings did you think he was going to? And I was like, really? So, you know, everything gets worked out. And as far as being in the process, my daughters actually babysit at the AA meetings. So it's become a bit of a family affair. But you know, when, when dealing with somebody who is that sick and that angry, I mean, there were, there were a lot of discussions you know, between God and I. Not when, when the kids were little, it never occurred to me to leave. 
because I always like to look at big picture and I'm like, well, you know, if we get divorced, there's gonna be shared custody and if there's shared custody, he's gonna have them and when he has them, he's gonna be drunk and he's gonna be driving and I can't control that situation. So the only way to keep them safe is for me to stay. Well, now we, we go through six years down the line, he's now back at it and, and ugly and I've never been in a situation where I've had somebody spit words at me and the one day, the last day, when I said it out and said, you know, you're gonna have to figure this out. You can't stay here anymore. But I want you to know that I love for you, love you and I pray for you every day. And he looked at me and he goes, good for you. I've never seen that much hate come out of somebody who was raised in the church and for lack of a better term, knew better. Knew better. And it, it got really bad to the point where we ended up in the ER and they did all kinds of tests on him and you're gonna think that I am a horrible person. The doctor came back and he goes, good news, there's no kidney damage and there's no liver damage. I said, what? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me after all of this? There is not one thing wrong with him. A little bit of an ungrateful spirit. But I thought, you know, he's stolen all the money from his kids. He doesn't care if they have what they need. He doesn't care about anything but himself. Maybe if there was some type of, you know, damage to his body, he'd figure it out. But there wasn't. He was in the hospital to dry out for four days. Four days. And during that time, I had a lot of meetings at work. Nobody I work with knows that I'm married to an alcoholic. Most of my friends don't know that I'm married to an alcoholic. Pride and control. And loving somebody that has a disease is very humbling. And as a control freak, it's very difficult to deal with because I can't control him. Think about it. I'm in an environment where many of you in this room, for an hour, I control you. <laughs> Sometimes joyfully and willingly, sometimes no, but still. And then to be put in a position where I have no control. And, you know, I've, I've, there's been <coughs> angry at God. Yeah, I'm, I've been angry at God. But, you know, the last nine times out of ten, I mean, yeah, it took me a year to get pregnant for each one of my kids, but I did. He gave them to me. They're healthy. They're happy. They're teenagers, so they're sassy, but I'm, you know, I'm still blessed to have them. You know, four years of sobriety is better than not. So it was funny when I when I met with Julie. She goes, "Do you have, you know, a favorite scripture or anything?" And I'm like, "What do you got for control?" Because that is a big mm. issue for me because I like to drive everything. And so she said, "You know, Psalm uh, 46, verse 10. How does how does it start? You know." Be still. And I always think of, you know, adult grabbing a child. You know, God grabbing me. Be still and know that I am God. You think that you're driving this train? You're lucky that I give you a shot to be a co-pilot. <laughs> and there are days that I struggle with that. But I really appreciate, you know, you wanting to listen to my story, I told Julie, I'm like, you pretty sure? Because I kind of feel like a hypocrite because there are days when, you know, things aren't going well in the weight room that I don't exactly use Christian type language. <laughs> and, um, you know, still growing on that, but, um, you know, I appreciate each and every one of you and, you know, I hope this story has helped you in some way and I'm, you know, where I live most of the time, so if you have any questions, feel free to come and see me.